Welcome back to the studio. I hope, trust you've enjoyed those messages. We are privileged in the next part of our program to have a very special guest with us, Dr. R. T. Kendall. Welcome to the studio today. Thank so you, stay, Nathan. Stay seated. Huh? Great to have you here. Great to be and, here. You uh, honor me. Well, mm -hmm. we're honored to have you here. And I want to get right to the questions today because you have so much experience mm. and so much. You don't need to rub it in just because I look, <laughs> look, look so old. No, no, no. no. You have a sense of humor too. But you've just ri you've written 50 books. Wow. Well, you've just written your 50th, so I'm told. And uh, and uh, you've just re you're you're about to release in March. These are the days of Elijah brand new book. Uh, Dr. Kendall. Uh, you can call me RT. Uh, do you need to be formal here in this part of Canada? <laughs> I don't have to be anything, but I was doing it out of respect. But That's all right, Nathan. Well, RT. thank you, sir. Um, why, 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 why write this book about Elijah? The last series of messages I did when I was in London, uh, we went through the whole life of Elijah. And I always thought one day I'd like to turn it into a book. And uh, so my publisher, they were very keen that I do this book on Elijah. So it was, you know, not anything spectacular that led me to it. It was just a natural thing to do because I, I knew the material and it was easy to do. Mm. Hmm. You mentioned London. You were there pastoring, I believe. There was a church there called Westminster Chapel. Famous church. Okay. Well, I didn't know what some know about it. Some mm -hmm. confuse it with Westminster Abbey. Ah, uh, yeah. <laughs> Not that. <laughs> uh, Westminster Chapel. Uh, Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones was yes. there 30 years before him, G. Campbell Morgan. Campbell Morgan put Lloyd-Jones there. Lloyd-Jones put me there. And I was there 25 years to the day. And you were privileged, I think, from your bio, that you were privileged to be mentored by him, Dr. Mort Lart Martin Lloyd-Jones? I Lord am Jones. a very blessed man to have had him uh, as my mentor for the first four years that I was in London. Uh, I was actually his pastor, would you believe it? Really? But, but he was my advisor. And uh, every week, every Thursday, for the first four years I was there, for two hours. I would go to him with my sermon preparation for the following weekend and read every word I planned to do. He virtually vetted every sermon really? I did for the first four years. You know. And uh, it was such an honor. Not many ministers in the history of the Christian church have had the privilege that I had to be mentored by him. If I may, I'm leaving the script a little bit, but what would, what would be one of the main things you learned from Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones? Hmm. He's, such a, he's such a, yeah. a hero of the faith, but maybe, maybe there's too many to, to say even one. So well, that's... Uh, things will come up maybe as we talk. Yeah, absolutely. If, I've never been asked that before, quite like that. I think the answer is, he taught me how to think. Hmm. Really? That would be the way I'd put it. He taught me how to think. I can't say he taught me how to preach. Uh, he taught me how to think. And uh, I'm indebted to him. Mm. And I, I learned how to be mastered by the text. And don't import things to the text. Don't go to the pulpit with something you're wanting to say. Don't ever do that. Mm. If the text doesn't call for it, don't say it. And that's the essence of expository preaching. You go through a verse and say what it means. And don't try to con be contrived by making the writer say something that hadn't even crossed his mind. Mm. Uh, just be true to the text and let the Holy Spirit go from there. Mm. Fascinating. Now back to your book, In the Days of Elijah. You, in your book, you say that Elijah was both ordinary mm. and extraordinary That's right. at the same time. Explain that to us. Well, uh, ordinary. The thing I like about Elijah is it's so human. Uh, I can't prove this, but I don't think a book has been written on Elijah before that made him so human and so ordinary. Uh, you know, the verse in James, at the end of James, he said, Elijah was a man just like us. Mm -hmm. So the King James says, a man of like passions. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, the more you study the life of Elijah, you see how ordinary he is and how human. <laughs> He took himself so seriously. Mm. Here he is on Mount Carmel, and it's his finest hour. 
And all of a sudden, he says something that's just not true. I alone am left. <laughs> that's just not true. He wasn't the only one. Not only that, he had just been with Obadiah days before, who was hiding prophets <laughs> and, and preserving God's men. But Elijah felt that he was a cut above all the rest. I alone am left. You know what? God could have said, stop, call the whole thing off. We'll do it another mm -hmm. day. We've got to get you sorted out first, Elijah. Mm. But no, he just went on with it. Fire came down. It was Elijah's finest hour. And then some time later, weeks, months later, God said, oh, by the way, Elijah, <laughs> I need to talk to you. And he got sorted out. You see, I find that's the way God is with all of us. He doesn't wait until we're perfect before mm. we can be used. Mm. And, and the thing I like about Elijah is that if God could use Elijah, he can use anybody. Mm. Mm. And uh, I wrote the book to show that the most ordinary, <clears throat> ordinary person can be used. Mm. He doesn't have to have so much training mm. uh, or have a certain kind of personality. Mind you, he does need preparation. Mm. And God didn't simply call Elijah and say, now go to Mount Carmel. There were years of preparation. And... Uh, I'll tell you, you ask about Dr. Lloyd-Jones. I think one of the finest lessons he ever taught me was, I quote, the worst thing that can happen to a man is to succeed before he's ready. Mm. And God wanted to make sure that Elijah didn't get to Mount Carmel until he was ready. Mm. And so all that goes on from the time he confronts Ahab, uh, then he's fed by the, uh, in the, in, at the brook, uh, when it dries up and then he goes to see this widow and has to say impertinent things you know feed me and she was she had nothing and all these things were part of Elijah's preparation but then extraordinary oh my word was he ever I mean who do you know who has confronted prophets like that who do we have in our generation that could confront politicians church leaders apostate men and call a spade a spade and say, we're going to have a showdown and see whose God is the God of mm -hmm. the Bible. Mm -hmm. And Elijah was unafraid to do that. Mm -hmm. And for the fire to come down and vindicate him in front of everybody, there's never been anything quite like that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You mentioned God providing for Elijah. What can we learn from that? What can we learn from God's provision, seeing how Elijah well, was fed by the birds? I think the main thing is you never know how God's going to do it. <laughs> you come to the end and you think, I'm finished, can't go on. And you had one source, you thought, it's dried up, we're finished. And God says, really? Watch what I do. And Elijah could never have dreamed that that would be the way God would do it. Hmm. And so it teaches us from having to go to the same old place, same old source and say, this is the way our need will be supplied. God has a thousand ways and a thousand more that when he uses up those to show that he's God and he's in control. Mm. So what do you say to somebody who's having a financial or a health crisis? They feel like their book, brook has dried up, so to speak. What do you say to that person watching? I say that God is never too late. He's never too early. He's always just on time. And uh, uh, the same God who said, I will supply all your need. Hmm. Didn't say he's going to let you drive a Mercedes Benz tomorrow <laughs> afternoon. That's the big mistake of some people hmm. uh, implying that. In fact, it's not only a mistake, I think it's, it's bad. Hmm. <laughs> Don't get me started <laughs> on that. But I will say this, God looks after us hmm. and he won't desert us. I will never leave you, never forsake you. Hmm. Hmm. You talked about preparation time in Elijah's life, and I think in your book you described it as the great Christian paradox, if you will. Uh, can you describe that more in detail, what you mean by that, and well, what that means for us today? We're ready, and yet we're not ready. Uh, I can remember many years ago, writing in my Bible, uh, and I think I'd been married just a few months, 
My wife and I have been married 54 years. Congratulations. Well, thank well. you. How long have you been married? Eight years. Eight years. I'm glad you were able to answer that quickly. Uh, pretty, uh, okay. <laughs> well, you did all right. I guess I did. <laughs> I did. I did. <laughs> well, so did I. Uh, but I remember just a couple months after being married, I wrote in my Bible, <laughs> I could show it to you. You know, I have a message. I'm ready to go. Words to that effect. Mm. And I think God looked down from heaven, the angels, and said, really? <laughs> and when I think of how arrogant I was to imagine that. All right, having said that, there was a sense in which I was, because the anointing of the Holy Spirit was there. I was spirit-filled, and uh, I had certain natural gifts. But the fact that we have an anointing doesn't mean we're ready to go. Take, for example, when Samuel anointed little David with oil, and it says the Spirit of the Lord came upon David from that day. One might say, well, ah, you're anointed to be king. David wasn't ready to be mm -hmm. king. Mm -hmm. His anointing needed to be refined. It would be another 20 years before he would uh, be king. And so, I look back on my life, I, I was no more ready 54 years ago. I wasn't even close. But God, in His way, mm. uh, had a way of keeping me preserved until maybe one day He could use me. <laughs> and He has done that wonderful. What's one of your greatest memories ministering over those, all those years at Westminster, the church in London, or even now in, in America? You're ministering in America. I read in your book that I, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but God's called you now to, uh, to the charismatic uh, movement, I think you, you wrote. Well, <laughs> well, I decided after 23 years in London, I'd probably stay 25 years. Uh, Dr. Lloyd-Jones was there 30. And they all wanted me to stay 30. <laughs> and uh, they said, stay another five years. Well, I thought, this is a good time to go. It's good. <laughs> you want to go when they want you to stay. It's like mm. preaching. I always would rather stop when they want you to keep Before going, they kind of get tired of then yeah. to stop when they think, oh, it's over, praise <laughs> God. I don't want that to be said of me in my preaching. And I thought, well, 25 years is about right. And the thing I wanted more than anything in the world, Nathan, Megan, is to see true revival in Westminster Chapel. It's what Dr. Lloyd-Jones wanted, It's what I wanted. And I began to think, it's not gonna come. It was hard to take, come to terms with that. And I thought, well, I'll go back to America. What will I do? No one knows me there. I'll go live in the Florida Keys. I, I like to fish. I'll be a fisherman uh, 25 hours a day, <laughs> six days a week. And you have I, a patient wife. <laughs> well, something. <laughs> I, if I said I heard a voice I, that's too strong, it wasn't audible, but it was real, just said, your ministry in America will be to charismatics. I said, oh no, please. <laughs> and I thought, if I have a ministry in America, I want it to be to evangelicals mm -hmm. because I've got the pedigree, I've got the credentials, I have what they need, my openness to the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Most evangelicals, not all, but most of them are what they call cessationists. You know that word? Mm -hmm. That not the open. miracles ceased, ceased exactly. with the closing of the can of scripture. And you know, the gifts don't need them, don't have them, out of the question. That's not true. Uh, that's not biblical at all. And I thought, if I have a ministry, let it be to evangelicals. Sorry, charismatics. Okay, well, it, it's turned out that way. I'd say 80 to 90 percent, not all, but nearly all, of my invitations are to what are called charismatics. Mm. And, mm. and so the trouble is, charismatics are a little suspicious of me because of my Reformed theology. Mm. Reformed people don't want me because they call me <laughs> charismatic. <laughs> you know? so it, it, Oh, I should say, I'm like Elijah. I alone am left. <laughs> Not true. But I do have to fight the Elijah complex. You know, <laughs> you start feeling sorry for yourself. Uh, I love but, what you wrote. Oh, sorry. 
Go that's ahead. well. That's all. I, uh, my ministry for the last ten years. Uh, uh, here I am in Toronto with John Arnott. Uh, mm -hmm. I endorsed the Toronto blessing many years ago when I was still in London mm -hmm. uh, in 1994. I was. I didn't do it the first day because when I first heard about it, I said it's not of God. <laughs> And I didn't want it to be of God. In fact, if it was of God, it would have come to Westminster Chapel first. And, you know, <laughs> this is my pride. Uh, but eventually, I, I saw I was wrong. I mm. affirmed it. So John Arnott and I are friends, and that's why I'm in Toronto mm. at the moment, preaching at Catch the Fire Church. Here in Toronto. Well, we're glad that mm -hmm. you're here and took the time. I, I read in your book, Word, Spirit, and Power, one of your other 50 books, that your Damascus experience, as you put it. And, uh, and that was, I was fascinated by that. Well. Uh, that happened quite a while ago. I was driving in my car. I was brought up in the Church of the Nazarene. Have you ever heard of that denomination? Yes. Mm -hmm. I grew up a Baptist, independent Baptist myself. Okay. Well. But I'm not comparing. I'm mean, <laughs> just. Well, I uh, was a student at Trevecca Nazarene College in Nashville and pastor of a little church uh, in Palmer, Tennessee. Mm -hmm. And I would on weekends go to this church and during the week I was a student at Trevecca. One Monday morning driving in my car unexpectedly didn't cross my mind I had never had anything like this happen in my life and driving the car and there's the Lord Jesus interceding for me at the right hand of God as real hmm. as I look at you. Hmm. Wow. The next thing I remember, by the way, when I get to heaven, I want a DVD replay to see <laughs> everything, you know, what all was going on. Yeah. An hour later, <clears throat> 10 miles outside of Nashville, a little town called Smyrna, as I came through, a surge of warmth went into my chest. I could feel it. It was physical. I could feel it. Mm. And I was given assurance of my salvation. Mm. There was Jesus looking at me, only lasted about 30 seconds, but it was real, looking at me, more real than you are right now. Mm. And before the day was over, I'd experienced what I would call Reformed theology. I knew I was eternally saved. I knew I'd been chosen from the foundation of the world. Mm. And I thought I saw things no one had seen before. Well, I was wrong because God simply brought me into the mainstream of historic Christianity. Mm. Um, so what I long for today, Nathan, is to see the Word and the Spirit to come together. I take the view that there has been a silent divorce in the church speaking generally between the Word and the Spirit. Now when there's a divorce, sometimes the children stay with the mother. Sometimes the children stay with the father. Mm -hmm. Well, in this divorce, you have those that are on the word side and those on the spirit side. Mm -hmm. What's the difference? Well, take those on the word side. What's the emphasis? We need to get back to expository preaching, infallibility of scripture, know your doctrine, uh, rediscover justification by faith, sovereignty of God. What's wrong with that emphasis? Nothing. It's exactly right. Mm. Those on the spirit side, what's the emphasis? We need to get back to the book of Acts. Signs, wonders, miracles, gifts of the spirit. Get into Peter's shadow, you're healed. When they played, prayed, the place was shaken. Light of the Holy Spirit, you're struck dead. <laughs> that is the kind of power we need today. What's wrong with that emphasis? Nothing. It's exactly right. Mm. But Nathan, Megan, wherever I go in the world, with few exceptions, it's either one or the other. You can mm. almost tell as soon as you step into a church, whether it's a word church, spirit church, and neither will learn from the other. The word people say, we believe in the Holy Spirit, and the spirit people say, what do you think we preach? We believe in the Bible. And they don't get it. But all I can say is, that the simultaneous combination will result in spontaneous combustion. Mm. And since you kindly wrote, uh, mentioned the book Word, Spirit, Absolutely. Power. Absolutely. I was, I was fascinated yeah. reading it well, earlier. Well, uh, Jack Taylor and Charles Kahn and I wrote that together. 
uh, they're with me here in Toronto at the moment. Uh, word, spirit, power. That's the emphasis on word and spirit, mm -hmm. and the result will be power. Mm -hmm. uh, tell you another thing I say in that book, and uh, if you haven't come across this, remember you heard it today. In 1992, at the Wembley Conference Center in London, I gave what was the most controversial address of my life. Got me into more trouble than any address I ever gave. And here's what I said. In the life of Abraham, for 13 years, Abraham sincerely thought that Ishmael was the promised child. You know how God had said to him, you're going to uh, have a son, or he didn't put it that way. Originally, just said your seed will be as the sand of the sea, the stars of the heaven. Mm -hmm. And that would mean it would come from him, and it would mean a son. Nothing was happening. And so he sleeps with Hagar. Ishmael's born, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and it's his son. It's from his loins. He thought, mm, it's not what I expected, but it's okay. It'll do. And Exactly, it'll do. And for 13 years, he thought Ishmael was it. One day God said, wrong. Sarah will conceive. Isaac is coming. Oh, says Abraham, please let it be Ishmael. Please let it be Ishmael. Sorry. Sarah will conceive. Isaac is coming. Now that was the foundation for that address I gave at Wembley Conference Center. And here's what I said. What we've seen up to now, charismatic movement, wherever, is Ishmael. Hmm. And everybody says, this is it. What we're saying, you know, it's cross-denominational lines. It's all over Latin America, third world. This is it. Wrong. Isaac is coming. As the promise to Isaac was a hundred times greater than the promise to Ishmael. So what is coming down the road mm. will be a hundred times wow. greater than anything we've ever seen. The greatest move of the Spirit since Pentecost. Isaac is coming. And you know what? When I first gave that address, nearly every charismatic leader in Britain turned angry. How dare I say that you've called us Ishmael? <laughs> now mm. they've come to me and said, RT, not only do we think you're right, we certainly hope you are, because if what we have now, if this is it, mm. we're in bad shape. Mm. The church has not turned the world upside down. Where do you find in the world that the church is respected and there's fear of the church? It's not, not around. They laugh at the church in England. They laugh at the church in America. I don't know about Canada, but I can tell you the church is making no impact. Mm. But when this comes, when the word and the spirit come together, and it's right back in the book of Acts, the world will take notice. Isaac is coming. That is my message, and it's my message today. And uh, we must pray that it will happen soon. And I will be so bold as to say, it's not only coming, I expect to see the beginnings of it. And I'm 77 years old. <laughs> so we'll see. Amen. Well, before we've got three minutes left, so I want to make sure our viewers know to this book that you've just been speaking about is Word, Spirit, and Power. The information is on the screen how to get this book. Uh, please go get this. This is a great book. Um, more, about his, more about your testimonies in there. I, was, I have it all marked up. There's not, not enough time to ask you all the questions, unfortunately. I can sit here for hours. The other book, of course, these, which, which is about to be released in March, March right. of this year, uh, but uh, Dr. Kendall was so gracious enough to come here in advance uh, as well. That is on the screen. So do uh, write down all that information and make sure we get that. So, But I want to get back to Dr. Kendall because I can sit here for hours listening to you, sir. I'm really enjoying my Myself. Um, back to Elijah, I guess, which is uh, the primarily why I think uh, we came here to talk today. Elijah, what can we learn from Elijah's experience with the widow uh, to help us lead extraordinary lives? The willingness to be brazen and be willing to be cheeky, if necessary, <laughs> for the glory of God. How hard it must have been for Elijah to put that widow on the spot 
and she, she had nothing left. And he says, mm -hmm. I want you to prepare food for me. And it was the most impertinent thing. It was a test. It was a test. You see, God doesn't lead us from A to Z, but from A to B, B to C. Jesus said, he that is faithful in that which is least is faithful also in much. So it was a test to see if he would talk to her in that way. Mm. You know, it must have been hard for him. And it was hard for her, I'll tell you. And God puts us on the spot mm -hmm. in that very manner just to see what we're made of. Mm. So that when the day of real testing comes, we'll be ready. That's fascinating because usually when I, you look at that story, you think of the widow and she gave up her bread. So you think, well, it was hard for her, but it, you're right. It was hard for, it would have been hard for Elijah to ask her of that. Mm -hmm. I mean, imagine that. Wow. Well, we're down to our last minute. And so I want to I say a big thank you to you, Dr. Kendall. Well, for you being... honor me. It's a privilege. No, no, <laughs> you're, we're, we are the honored one. Let's trust me. And I, I want to make sure we get on the screen again, uh, both of these books, Words, Spirit, and Power. Please put that up. Uh, Dr. R.T. Kendall has co-authored that book with yeah. uh, Charles Karen and Jack Taylor, both of whom are in Toronto with you now at the Toronto Airport Christian Fellowship. And as well, these are the days of Elijah, about to be released in March 2013. So all the information is on the screen how to uh, get a hold of that. Dr. Kendall, we have 30 seconds left. Could you just pray for us sure. in that last moment? And for the viewers at home, I see. Okay. Heavenly Father, what a privilege to be with this lovely couple, Nathan and Megan. And I pray for them, just for them, that there be upon them from this moment, from this moment, mm. an ever-increasing anointing of wisdom, love, and power. Cover them day and night by the blood of Jesus. Preserve them, protect them. Supply their every need and guide Thank them you, by Lord. your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank you so much, sir. We're honored to have you here today. Thank you. Thank you, viewers, for viewing at home. God bless you. Bye-bye.